Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure being with you here today in this event. So thanks to OTM Sage for arranging such uh, great events and giving us the opportunity to be here. Uh, uh, I think the day is going very fast. Uh, we are left probably with two more sessions after this one, and I know it might be not easy to present some technical content at the end of the day. So uh, during this presentation, we'll be moving a little bit away from the technical content. Uh, so it's an opportunity to give you a little break from the deep technical insight, even though I'm really personally enjoying a lot the uh, amount of information we are getting about OTM and WMS enhancements and uh, uh, capabilities and functionality since morning. While during this session, we'll be talking about uh, main disruptor and opportunity as well for most of retailers worldwide, which is uh, the e-commerce. So the total size of e-commerce mar market worldwide in retail industry is uh, calculated to be close to 2.3 trillion uh, USD, which represents almost 10% of total retail sales worldwide. That's the figure which was reported by the end of 2017. Still, that has grown in uh, 2018 by 12% to become uh, 2.9 trillion USD. And this year, it's expected to be uh, growing again at 14% penetration from total retail sales worldwide to close this year with 3.5 trillion USD uh, internationally. So, uh, growth rate also is uh, quite uh, massive. Uh, to 28 gross for 2017 versus 2018. It's not going with the same base, it's going a little slowly now, but still it's more than 25% uh, in 2018 and uh, slightly higher than 20% by the end of 2019. Still with that, it's expected to reach 5 trillion USD by the end of 2021. So clearly this is uh, a huge opportunity, but at the same time it's a huge disruptor for any business uh, internationally. And again, it's not necessarily for this business which comes downstream. It's a disruptor for anyone, right? From raw material productions or raw material uh, manufacturers all the way up to retailers like our case. So that's the size globally, but when it comes to uh, Middle East and North Africa region from where uh, we, uh, we come, then it's uh, only 8.3 8, uh, 8 billion USD which is apparently a very low figure. It's less than 0.5% uh, from the total uh, market worldwide. But still, there are uh, two very important things to observe, that it's only coming with 1.9% retail penetration in Middle East versus an average of 5 to 10% uh, in uh, the most developed countries like uh, US or uh, UK or France or Europe generally. And uh, it's, uh, expect, uh, it's coming with also uh, a growth of 25% for, for the last four years and expected still to keep growing, maybe with a slightly lower percentage than 25%, to reach uh, approximately 28.5 billion USD with 7% penetration by uh, 2022. So again, uh, the expectation of growth of this market in Middle East and North Africa is still very high. What's also unique about Middle East and uh, North Africa is uh, the growth rate, what I have mentioned already, where this year it's growing till now with 21.3%, making it the third most growing market for e-commerce internationally in terms of percentage of growth, definitely not in terms of value. Its contribution to uh, the total GDP of the countries is still very low, which makes it uh, very much potential for growth in the coming period. What's also unique and interesting about Middle East and North Africa is the high uh, internet and social penetration, which is very much comparable and even some points of time it's even higher than most of the developed countries when it comes to uh, e-commerce. So we, for example, in uh, UAE and KSA, we have 91 and 73 percent internet penetration, which is actually very high percent of internet penetration. So apparently for any retailer operating that needs to survive with uh, this yeah, huge disruption and who need to maintain their customers, then there is no option but providing customers with an integrated, complete view of all the channels they have. There is no option of uh, continuing to do business the same uh, regular way uh, retailers used to do business. And this is exactly what BWC were reporting in one major survey that they have did recently about e-commerce and its impact on uh, retail industry. So a little bit uh, about myself. I'm Said Al-Sayed. I'm Supply Chain Applications Department Manager of uh, Nahdi Medical Company. Nadi Medical Company is uh, uh, the biggest and the leading uh, retail, uh, for, uh, retail chain of retail pharmacy in Saudi. I like to describe myself as uh, being a passionate digital transformation professional who likes to learn a lot and who likes to, and who spent last 12 years in, in my life working in IT industry. So I wish that was uh, the right thing to do to enjoy my career. Uh, uh, I work, I'm working with Nadi since 2016 and I'm helping and uh, leading a lot of supply chain transformations which are happening and we'll be talking about some of that in the coming few slides. 
Uh, I had the pride to work for uh, an Indian company early in my career that was one of the major names in India, it used to be called Satyam. Uh, but uh, now it's not, it's not yet anymore called Satyam, it's Tik Mahindra now. And this is actually my second visit to India and second uh, presentation for OTM after presenting back in the European version in 2017. So during this session, we'll be explaining you more how Nahdi Medical Company has used its uh, local market experience and the wide network of uh, stores we have throughout the country to redefine our uh, uh, Omnichannel uh, transformation and success in the region. So we'll be telling you a little more about Nahdi. I'm not sure if uh, a lot of people in the room knows about Nahdi Medical, apart from our partner Nis Baraj and uh, probably some of uh, Oracle teams. Then we'll be explaining to you the major disruptors, opportunities, and the challenges that has agitated and prompted our digital transformation. Then we'll talk about how uh, we handled our transformation journey in journey in e-commerce with particular focus on the logistics front the value chain execution, basically, transportation and warehouse management. Uh, and definitely we'll come across our uh, application footprint. And then before we uh, move in uh, Q&A, in case we have some time for Q&A, we'll be also explaining to you our way forward and the roadmap in this transformation journey. So briefly, Nahdi Medical started 33 years back, exactly in uh, 1986, by uh, opening two small pharmacies by Sheikh Abdullah Amr al-Nahdi. He is uh, one of the very famous entrepreneurs in Saudi. He opened only two small pharmacies in a city called Jeddah. It's a, a coastal city west in Saudi. And uh, 17 years later, 50% uh, of Nahdi has been acquired by Sitco Holding. Sitco Holding is another major uh, holding company in Saudi. Then we got transformed from being a family business into becoming a shareholder company. And since then, as you can see, we have expanded and grown uh, a lot from uh, having 200 stores in 2004 up to today where we operate more than 1,150 different pharmacy widely distributed across all cities of Saudi Arabia. Back in 2013, we had a major rebranding, or actually releasing our new brand of Nahdi. Just to help you imagine that, that's how we looked like uh, probably 30 or 20 years back, till 2013, where we have revamped all our branding and we have transformed a lot of our store structure to help uh, our guests have a unique and interesting shopping experience into our stores, and that's area to even integrate and get to our uh, online sales as well. Our uh, logo, and quickly, it's well representing our values, purpose, and mission. It's nothing but a heart, which is having a white part at the middle. This white part representing our community, purity, and health. And then the shield of the heart, this represents the different categories we operate with that protect our customers and protect our community from any, uh, God forbid, diseases or anything that can harm them. So the different categories we operate are beauty, uh, uh, baby and mom, everyday essentials, health and wellness, and definitely the promotions that also plays an important part of our operation. A uh, bit of brief about our size and our scale. We are more than 1,100 employees. We are uh, today more than 11, uh, 1,150 pharmacy. We exist in more than 145 uh, city and village in Saudi, and we are definitely the most widely spread uh, retailer in the whole country, not only in pharmacy, but across all industries. We today operate six different warehouses, and we have more than 160 refrigerated and dry trucks. Uh, some few figures, not in this slide, is that we uh, operate 1,100 different SKU, and we ship uh, more than 500,000 uh, pieces to our pharmacies every day, with a total consumption of uh, close to 12, 000, uh, sorry, 12 million uh, carton box and reusable plastic boxes that keep circulating in our supply chain. And we believe that uh, the total uh, distance traveled by our trucks is equal to Earth's diameter every one and a half day. So that's just to show you how many shipments we plan every day, uh, since we have to replenish all this wide network of stores with all our products throughout the day. So we definitely love our community. We serve 90 million or more than 90 million guests every year. And we are proud to be walking distance away from 90% of, for almost 90% of Saudi Arabia population. And we do also support and we do also work to provide a lot of uh, corporate social sustainability programs that we will talk about recently, uh, in, in, in a few minutes. So this is just a brief, uh, how we work to deliver our vision, which is being the most, to be the most trusted and loved pharmacy-led retailer, making a difference in the life of every guest we serve. Last but not least about Nahdi is our purpose, that we exist to add beats to everyone's life, and that's basically the heart which we have in our logo. That's brief about Nahdi. I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows about Nahdi since I know we are coming from a different territory and not everyone maybe is familiar with the Middle East and the Gulf region. 
Then the, the most important question we wanted to answer now is that what are exactly the disruptors and the opportunities that prompted us to take a, a digital transformation either in, uh, in omni-channel or in, uh, supply, in uh, logistics and supply chain. And we'll be defining omni-channel in detail after a few slides in case someone is not very, very much familiar with what is omni-channel. So, uh, basically, the biggest disruptor is the economy of scale and our growth in the past uh, uh, at least 10 years. So, as I mentioned, starting from 2004 till 2018, and today we are even more than this figure, we have grown from 200 stores to have more than 1,150 stores today. So definitely this is a scale that you cannot manage with uh, just manual systems, or it's nothing that you can manage with Excel sheets. This is a scale that you cannot be successful at without uh, deep efficiency, without uh, agile systems, without resilient supply chain. That's where we uh, realized that uh, yani, a lot of the things we were using, at least the transportation management, cannot continue uh, the same semi-automated way it used to be before we adopted OTM. Second major disrupt uh, disruptor for us was what I was just talking about, the e-commerce and the digital disruption. Uh, Saudi population is 33 million. The GDP of Saudi in 2015, it was uh, quite big. It's uh, uh, 640 uh, uh, billion USD. But what's interesting about that is that we have 60% of Saudi population less than uh, 30 years. So the demographics of Saudi, uh, it already includes a lot of millennials, and those becoming again uh, either a risk or an opportunity for people who knows how to give them a, a, a seamless shopping experience. And as I mentioned in the first slide, we already have very high internet and social penetration rates, which are as comparable as US and UK. Uh, one more uh, main disruptor which has started to be uh, very visible in the last couple of years is the female economy, what so-called the female economy. So uh, out of that demographic, or out of that, of that uh, 33 million, we have 42% or close to 14 million, which are females. And now, uh, recently, they have been empowered a lot to start driving, uh, if, if, if you have heard about that. And uh, they started a lot also to be uh, contributing a lot to the workforce in Saudi earlier that was not the case. They were not that much empowered. Today, as per quarter one, 2019, they represent 17.8% of the workforce in Saudi. And this number expected to grow by 2030 to become 30%. So again, this itself is a huge disruptor because it's changing altogether the shopping experience and the shopping behavior, uh, assuming that, and we know that the female uh, economy and the way female do shopping is, is altogether different in, in this case. So it's a, a great opportunity for people who can use data to bring some kind of intelligence and can decide how to provide a more female-friendly even shopping experience, which is integrated through all the channels. Yet we had one more uh, major disruptor, a huge disruptor, disruptor actually, which is the National Transformation Program of Saudi. So uh, a National Transformation Program is a roadmap that had been put in place back in 2016, and it basically outlines uh, uh, the roadmap to achieve Saudi uh, ambitious 2030 vision. That's a vision of Saudi to minimize dependency on uh, oil prices and to become more resilient towards any changes in Saudi in oil prices worldwide. So uh, it, it, it's, it's coming with hundreds of KPIs, hundreds of benchmarking indicators and initiatives and objectives. But what um, worth to be mentioning is that it's expected to cost 70 billion USD across different initiatives and different, different projects, and 40% of out, out of that expected to be funded even from the private sector. So it's truly a game changer for anyone existing in this region, not only in Saudi, even in the whole Gulf or Middle East, since Saudi is already the biggest economy in Middle East and in Gulf particularly. Uh, and it comes with three main objectives or three main pillars. Number one, public sector physical reforms, then enhancing and diversifying the economic and business environment of Saudi. Again, the basic target here is to increase the revenues coming from a non-oil sector. There are a lot of opportunities here. Uh, one, one of the KPIs only from this initiative or from this program is to increase the revenue of uh, the private healthcare sector from 300 million Saudi Riyal today to 4 billion Saudi Riyal, uh, sorry, 4 billion USD, not Saudi Riyal, 4 billion USD by the year uh, 2030. So that comes with a hell of opportunities, with a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for people who are ready, who are starting already to be in, particularly in the primary health care, uh, which is being now pushed from the public sector to the private sector. So we started also to operate in the primary health care clinics in Saudi. Last but not least is the so social reforms and domestic social transformations, which are already uh, yani moving very fast now. Our DNA is pharmacy. Our DNA is medicine. So we cannot, we cannot uh, be away also from such 
pillars since we uh, do a lot of corporate social sustainability programs to uh, provide more healthy lifestyle for Saudi community and even in the whole region. We'll talk also about this after a few slides. Yet, all of that doesn't come free of challenges. So, this has resulted into increasing the energy cost uh, uh, substantially compared to uh, the last five or six years. Labor costs also, particularly skilled labor costs, has been increasing a lot. So again, another two major disruptors resulting in more demand of green supply chain, resulting in more demand of resilient supply chains that are using more of cloud technologies, using more of uh, uh, things like IoT and becoming more even efficient to have an integrated digital supply chain, not just a linear supply chain. Uh, so, out of that, we can clearly see that the size of opportunity is already huge. We are talking about, for the region, 28.5 billion USD by the year 2022, and targeting to reach a penetration rate of, sorry, I think uh, the pointer is not coming, so, and, and, and approaching a penetration percent close to 7% of total retail sales by that year. So, just to uh, complete the view before we move into Nahdi transformation itself, there were two main challenges for this cycle, or for uh, the uh, yani healthy development of e-commerce market. Number one, payment process. So again, knowing that uh, the region is coming with a very high credit uh, uh, penetration rates and even close to, very, uh, to the developed markets like UK and France, still 62% of uh, the customers in the Middle East, they prefer cash and delivery versus paying online with credit cards or debit cards or whatever, digital wallets. So that comes because of a reason. Basically, uh, uh, first of all, that results into decreasing delivery rates a lot. It, it results into uh, increasing return rates, and it doesn't give uh, e-commerce providers ability to break even even after 10 years. So, if we just wear the hat of the guest for a minute, this is how his shopping experience used to look like uh, uh, in the Middle East to some extent, since we are still developing. So. A uh, lot of dilemma, a lot of confusing things, lack, lack of information, even specs were not usually complete. No single source to have uh, something like uh, trusted reviews, uh, uh, lot, uh, unclear processes. So a lot of things has impacted the guest journey for, for e-commerce to the extent that uh, without an option like cash and delivery, e-commerce market wouldn't have been able even to catch up in the region. But even though this has been improved a lot by working on, on, on different things like giving a clear categories, detailed specs, also giving uh, more uh, trust and the credibility by simply shipping the right product, which is a very simple thing, but yet it has very positive impact in uh, e-commerce market and, uh, and, and, and eliminating the cash on delivery, which uh, complicates a lot of things. And also having more confidence for the guest in uh, the return process. So you need to be confident that even if he gets a, a product that uh, is different than what he wanted to have or is not the same what he wanted to have, uh, so customers need to have confidence you will be able to return it back in a smooth process, which is not yet Yani, or, or it's not almost uh, always the case. Even though the second challenge here, uh, apart from payment process and cash and delivery, assuming that this uh, customer has put his order, is in the logistics area. So apparently the time and speed and cost of uh, delivering e-commerce orders in Middle East and North Africa is three times higher than the standard uh, worldwide, which is again another challenge for uh, this industry in Middle East to pick up and to improve in a, in a healthy way. And that also comes because of a reason. So the level of development of, uh, of couriers in the region is not yet also up to speed. Uh, that's why many retailers and many players in e-commerce decided to do their own systems and their own development of last mile delivery. Addressing system is not developed. It's, it's again, yeah, uh, lagging behind. Uh, there are also uh, unavailable clear uh, uh, land route custom clearance between neighboring countries. So many of the players uh, uh, yeah, end with shipping using air mode, which is definitely much more expensive. But most important is the complexity behind e-commerce fulfillment model. So it's already complex, and that requires a lot of investment in integrating many systems together and in having clear process in place to be able to fulfill the right product to the right customer from the right source through the right channel. So that complexity really requires a lot of investment in IT, in, 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 whole, in the whole ecosystem, not only IT system, but in the whole eco ecosystem. And this is where uh, we'll be talking a little bit in the coming few slides, but, uh, with particular focus on our transformation in the logistics track. So the next question is then, so how all these uh, uh, disruptors and opportunities, how did they uh, impact our transformation for omnichannel, and how did they 
uh, 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 and how did we address this kind or this much of logistics challenges what we have talked about? Basically, let's agree that omnichannel is not a multi-channel and it's not a cross-channel. Omnichannel is a sales, a sales strategy where you get all your channels integrated into a, a seamless integrated fashion. So you give your uh, guest or your customer uh, a, an integrated uh, uh, experience, very smooth to do shopping from any place he can access. So he can do that from a desktop, from a mobile, from, a mobile, from telesales, even, even in the store. So this doesn't definitely mean that the stores will be closing. I think it's, it's the opposite, but the stores actually has to be well integrated, or the brick and mortar model has to be well integrated with all the other channels available. So basically, it's the retailer moving to the customer, not the customer coming to the product. That's, that's definitely what Omnichannel is about. So the traditional or classical understanding that the customer has to walk in and come to you as a retailer and purchase the product is not any more valid. And I, and I think personally that anyone who continues thinking this way will not exist after a few years. So, so one of the main characteristics is that we need to exist where the customer is, which is apparently a dream for us and for any ret retailer. And that's the only way that we can help us to give a consistent, a consistent and integrated experience for that customer. Some other characteristics is that you need to deal with your customer a single view. So uh, it's different than the multi-channel where you can deal with the same customer across multiple channels in a different format. But here, if the same customer deals, you still deal with him as one profile, as one customer. Still, you need to give him personalized offering based on the channel he's using to uh, shop with you. So you are giving him much more option. Uh, for example, taking just a couple of examples, ordering online and going to the uh, physical store to receive his product, or vice versa, going to the store to purchase something and then finding out that you have an exclusive online promotion and deciding not to purchase it in the store and go to a digital screen inside the store and just place an online order and go to his home and then receive it after one or two hours. So it's giving definitely more option, which comes with more complexity. That's what I was talking about in the last slide, that complexity is much higher in, in, in omnichannel. Your integration is crucial, is fundamental. Integration between all the ecosystem is uh, unavoidable in such cases. So, same applies for a CRM, whether it's a feedback, survey, reality, whatever it is, it has also to be integrated well across all the different channels of Omnichannel. And definitely, the consolidated inventory management because you cannot afford, and I think this is also we were yani, uh, talking about, and yani, it was also addressed in aerial presentations that you cannot manage Omnichannel by just having a dedicated inventory uh, that can go uh, infin uh, infinite. So our end of mind objective was something close to that, that we wanted to have a, a, an existence and we wanted to have a setup where our guests can order what they need from, any, from anywhere using any platform. And then we can have our sourcing engine and order management engine in between to decide what is the most optimal cost effective uh, fulfillment location and point to fulfill this demand for our customers. So it's, 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 it looks a good dream, it looks a great dream, and I think everyone would like to uh, do it this way, but it's not that simple. It's not that simple as it looks like, particularly with uh, a complex application footprint, uh, what most of retailers have like that. So our application footprint is not simple at all, and that's common for most of retailers. Even if you take part of that, which is supply chain execution, and if we just zoom in to focus on warehouse management and transportation management and planning, even integrating that with your extended online and omnichannel experience might not be that easy. Thankfully, that was not our case, uh, thanks to the cloud offering, thanks to SaaS model, thanks to the rich APIs offering that helped us to have a smooth and a quick uh, transformation in our supply chain execution. And again, I would, I would repeat it, that it has to be quick. If you are not quick enough, your market share is at risk. Uh, and today, what we do in uh, uh, e-commerce, we have three models existing today. So in the first model, we do a click and collect, a simple click and collect and click and collect model from the stores where our guest, so the cycle starts and ends by the guest, apparently. So in the click and collect, the guest starts by placing his online order uh, on a third party application, and then we have the order management layer that decides the best sourcing model of uh, uh, that order. So ideally, if this is a click and collect, then the sourcing model will decide, uh, in this case it will not decide, but it will give recommendations for the uh, uh, buyer at the commerce layer, and in this case, it's the guest who is selecting the source that he needs to go and collect from. So our role here is not more than just giving recommendations. Then all of that gets retailed to our retail application footprints, uh, retail merchandising systems, and our point of sale systems, and then the guest comes to the store to collect his order. That's one model of e-commerce uh, orders handling what we have today. In the second one, we do store delivery, we do uh, home delivery, 
from the store itself. And the difference between this model and the last model is that we have developed our uh, last mile delivery to take the product from uh, the most suitable source, uh, which is in this case a store, and deliver it to our guest home in uh, as per the address or location which, which has been uh, recorded. So last, last model is where we will decide that we will be doing delivery for this order not from the store, we'll be doing it from the DC. And again, that's based on uh, multiple factors, including the size of the product, the availability. We might, not need, we might not want to store all our products in the pharmacies and then have huge inventory for that. So again, our sourcing layer uh, at order management will come in between to decide what is ex where is exactly the best source of that product. And then it will continue the integration cycle. But what's uh, added here is the cloud WMS layer, since this order will be prepared in a warehouse, and today we are in already integrating uh, our third party e-commerce platform with uh, Oracle Cloud WMS to uh, prepare the order. Uh, we don't yet have integration with as a third party carrier, what we use here. So today we are using third party carrier. We are not yet de uh, uh, developing our own last mile delivery for this category of orders, and we are integrating with the third party carrier to deliver this order to our guests and close the proof of delivery. Uh, so, particularly when it comes to logistics area, uh, again, we came from the same regular or the same challenges which everyone rooms around. Lack of visibility, lack of processes, uh, uh, not meeting very well our SLAs, uh, 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 not having agile uh, processes that we can replan and we can uh, uh, implement smoothly. So with all of these challenges and having OTM and also Cloud AWS in place, this is where we uh, uh, started to have mobility, new KPIs, we have started to have accurate recording of our KPIs, and we started to have complete visibility and improving even our uh, automation and uh, reporting activities. Just to give you a bit of brief about our transformation, what we have did, we started three years back, more than three years back actually, quarter one, 2016, where we decided to uh, implement OTM uh, to migrate our transportation management from a semi-manual or a semi-automated structure to a fully automated structure. We kicked off, of, uh, we kicked off that project uh, on May uh, 16, and we had Enes Bairaj, who uh, are our partner, uh, our preferred partner since that time till today. So we implemented our uh, uh, OTM, we, we kicked it off actually during May 2016, and then the first site went live in three months. And again, that was the first early indication to Nehdi and to many uh, even uh, retailers in the region that going cloud is something that you can do very quickly and you don't need to spend a year or two or three to go live. So after three months, we were live with the first site and we followed a stepwise approach. We didn't want to go for a, a big bang kind of thing which might impact our operation and uh, availability in the store. Then a uh, few months later, uh, we, uh, because when we went live August 16, we went live only with OTM capability without complete tracking. So we didn't have the mobility in place. So uh, 2017, we started, uh, to, we went live with our end-to-end -end, uh, mobile application that was built on top of Enes Bairaj uh, ILM app. I will explain a little bit about this in uh, the coming few slides. And we started our rollout process. So our biggest DC got rolled out in May 2017. Then we continued to do final rollouts for our last warehouse during November 17. So by end of November 17, we had all our warehouses rolled out, all our warehouses already running OTM, end-to-end -end planning, execution, and tracking as well. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time to uh, take rest or to break, so a couple of months later, in Jan 18, we started another transformation with uh, Logfire, or Cloud WMS, where we kicked off our first warehouse, our first DC implementation in Jan 18, and we went live in July 18, considering that this has to integrate backward with a lot of uh, our retail application, basically retail, uh, retail merchandise planning and other applications also we use for reporting, since we use third-party application for reporting, so we had also to take complete integration between Cloud WMS and, uh, uh, and our uh, business intelligence tools. And last few months, we had uh, already started to implement Logfire in uh, one more DC, which is going to be the first DC for Nehdi outside Saudi. We are opening our first DC outside Saudi in UAE, uh, uh, in October, and this is also going to be operated by Logfire, and that's actually something which we like about the flexibility and agility of the product, that you can do it in a very small warehouse, which will hardly be not more than uh, a thousand pallet position, and you can still run the same product in a huge, heavily automated warehouse, and we'll also explain something about this soon. 
We're also uh, uh, kicking off and starting recently to implement it in our second DC in Saudi, which is located in a city called Abha. And that caters almost for 25% of our operation. So, a three years transformation journey is something that can create you a lot of benefits. But I will not definitely talk about all the benefits that we have achieved from this transformation. I will just select a few areas to talk about. The first area is uh, what we call Tasheel Mobile App. Tasheel is an Arabic word standing for making things simple. Tasheel Mobile App is Nahdi tailored application for tracking all OTM end to end. Uh, shipments. <coughs> it's built on top of uh, uh, Inspiraj uh, 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 applications that we have developed using uh, standard APIs to connect to Oracle and to connect to OTM and download and integrate uh, inbound and outbound with OTM. But this application gave us the ability to add some of the missing features we didn't have in the standard application. Uh, basically being able to operate both online and offline, so it has the two modes being able to scan, to scan the ship units and, and even scan the ship units in the store if something is missing. So if a driver going to a store and he is supposed to, or he is getting with a device that he has to deliver 100 or whatever number of cartons, and then he find out that he's not delivering exactly or he's having something missing, he can go and scan the cartons and then the application will help him identify what missing cartons he should look for. We had added also some additional functionalities that, was, that were important for us, including uh, doing a complete inspection cycle for the trucks for each and every shipment. So we track this also using mobility uh, mobile application. So we have two versions, one version for the drivers and one version for our inspectors or shipping coordinators. It allowed us also to measure customer satisfaction rates. So with each and every proven delivery, uh, proof of delivery at the store, we take a feedback from the pharmacist inside this store and he give a feedback and again, if he is rating any shipment a level of service low, he is forced to enter a reason for that and this is how we also enhancing the communication channel between two important nodes in supply chains, the warehouse and the customer of that warehouse, which is in this case internal customer. Last but not least is the reverse logistics where we have also used the ability of integrating and developing this app to cater for uh, whatever uh, return cartons or whatever return empty plastic boxes that uh, travel back from the pharmacy to the DC, which we have also uh, integrated within our cycle. So basically, that given us ability. Uh, number one, it's, it, 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 yeah, what's, what we like about that is that we were still able to do some kind of innovation, even though we had to do something which is not fully support, yeah, the, the interface itself is not supported, but this is where Inspiraj uh, yeah, comes in, but still it's built on top of uh, Oracle standard ABI, so we can still innovate with cloud offering. That's uh, the nice thing about it. But the most important from business perspective is that it helped us enhancing a lot along with OTM. It helped us to enhance our track utilization rates from 85% to 95% and to enhance our proof of delivery compliance that used to be a manual or a semi-manual process from 85% to close to 98%. So yeah, our uh, proof of delivery uh, process today is real time and that's very crucial for having even more accurate planning process since the moment you know that this product has reached this store, all our integrated planning applications will know this information and then you can plan more efficiently to avoid sending the same product two times to the store or to avoid not sending the product to the store on time. So that's even helping us enhance our shelf availability that accordingly, accordingly creating indirect, sale, indirect uh, uh, benefit for sales. But not only that, it's helping also to add a lot of more new, what about time? I think I'm, I'm good, huh? So it's helping us to add much more new KPIs that we were not even able to measure even before implementing OTM, like truck inspection compliance, the compliance of our uh, uh, carrier providers, the pharmacy satisfaction rates, uh, OTIV in the pharmacy, how much we are complying with our SLA to deliver to the pharmacy in a particular period of time. And if we look into our P&L, there has been quite improvement in our P&L during the year 2017 and 18, where in 2017 we shipped 24 more percent of cartons. So instead of shipping 10 percent only, we shipped, instead of shipping 10 million, we shipped 12.2 million cartons during that year. Still, we were able to manage that with a 3 percent less number of trucks and with a 2 percent less on our total cost of distribution, which had definitely a positive impact on our supply chain unit supply chain cost per unit KPI. So with that, thankfully, we were able to achieve also something very important, which is uh, being able today to cover 60% of Saudi geography with home delivery operation, either from the store or, or from the DC. And only last week with a mega promotion that we had did online, 
we were able for the first time ever for us at our scale at this stage to hit 2,700 or online orders in one day. For us, for other players, that number might be very small, but for us, that number is really significant for us since we didn't start a long time back. We started only less than a year back. And what's also interesting is that we are still only at a very low percentage of penetration. Our current penetration versus our total sales is still at 1.5%. So we believe that this number is going to grow hopefully exponentially in the coming period, at least to reach to uh, 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 3%, which is uh, average, but our target is even to go more than 3% in a few years. So that's uh, briefly what we have been doing in our transformation, particularly on omnichannel e-commerce and uh, logistics transformation. Uh, before we uh, move into the question and answer, in case we have some time, then just quickly talking about our next milestones and the way forward for our transformation. So basically, this is our current transformation footprint. When it comes to OTM, we are done with uh, five different DCs. Uh, UAE DC will not have it this year, it will have it next year. MDAD DC, just to explain to you, MDAD is, uh, I, would, I usually used to call it 250-250 DC. 250 because it's 250 square, uh, 250,000 square meters. And the other 250 is but because the total investment is 250 million Saudi riyal, which is a major investment for a DC in this region. So currently, we are already live with OTM in five different DCs. This the MDAD DC is going to be, is designed and, and planned to be a state-of-the-art warehouse with a lot of automations, including uh, MHE integrate, automated MHE, voice picking and light, and, uh, and light picking as well. And construction started this year and is expected to operate end of 2020. So basically, OTM expected to be live also by end of 2020, uh, uh, by 2020 in both UAE and MDAD warehouses. When it comes to WMS, we are not going to do WMS uh, cloud in our Jadda DCs because Jadda DCs will be uh, going to MDAD. They will be replaced and consolidated under MDAD warehouse. But still we did it in one warehouse, which is a slightly small warehouse because we wanted to use it. We wanted to see the product. We wanted to experience it. And thankfully, I, I'm not shy to say that personally, I was one of the people a uh, couple of years ago who was not high believer that WMS cloud is going to be very successful. But I'm not shy to say that. I'm, completely the opposite mindset today. I believe that that was the right decision to make, and if we go back, we'll, 100 times we'll definitely make the same decision to transform into cloud WMS. Currently, we're working in two more warehouses. Uh, the one for UAE expected to go live uh, next month uh, with Logfire, and uh, the, the other one is Abha DC. It's still at an early stage and expected to go live with Logfire in quarter one next year. Then, uh, uh, the priority after that will be MDAD warehouse in 2020, then Real DC in 2021. Again, we have other uh, automations coming in. Voice speaking expected to be existing in both MDAD and Riyadh. And MHE automation already uh, decided to happen with uh, Schaefer, uh, which is a German major MHE provider, and expected to go live next year for MDAD warehouse. Yet, not yet decided for Riyadh, but we have strategy to do the same in Riyadh, uh, in Riyadh for, for, uh, as well. That's not everything we have. There are a lot of other things that will come down the road. So we started to have much more requirements for track and trace either internally or forced by legal authorities, since we work also in medicine, where track and trace becomes very crucial for us. Uh, IoT requirements also, not only to trace the product, but to trace also the trucks which carry uh, medical products, yard management. So we have a lot of other things that I'm sure will come down the road, but it's not yet clear as we speak. So briefly, since IMDAD is a, a very crucial, huge transformation for us in the coming year or two, just to give you a brief about IMDAD Warehouse, this is, it's, it's planned to be two different buildings with admin building and utilities area. So it will have a big deal of automation. So uh, 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 it will have automated storage and uh, retrieval systems. That's basically how uh, the structure of this warehouse is going to look like. And the application footprint of that warehouse also is not going to be simple since it will have mapping to many products, including Oracle Cloud, WMS, uh, warehouse management, uh, Honeywell Vocollect for voice speaking, and for the WCS areas that will be definitely given to the uh, WCS provider. And again, all of that footprint has to integrate back to our complete ecosystem, uh, including a uh, lot of other applications uh, in our uh, corporate layer. So basically, uh, apart from the automation and voice speaking, clearly we are uh, and having, uh, thankfully, we are having uh, direction to move with uh, l almost all the application footprint apart from the automation layer. And the voice speaking is going to be Oracle footprint with only the automation and voice speaking that will be uh, provided by uh, uh, either Schaefer or third-party providers. 
That's basically our footprint for Imdad Warehouse. Next is a quick simulation. This is a quick simulation about Imdad Warehouse, how it will look like. So we're expecting a lot of systems and a lot of, not only IT systems, we're expecting a lot of uh, new technologies also that we'll be using on different layers of this warehouse. So I will not take time, because this video might take two minutes. I will not take time, but it's just to imagine the size and the number of uh, dog doors we have and the structure of this warehouse. So I think we are ready then to move to the questions, if there are any. Yeah, we have three questions. OK. So I, I think I have answered that, uh, probably. We have implemented it in five different warehouses for the uh, 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 delivery to the pharmacies. We, we are not yet implementing that for the last mile. We implemented it for the primary uh, sales to the pharmacy. Okay. Okay, so let me, let me just answer this. Uh, uh, again, uh, with all the challenges I have mentioned about the logistics and the uh, the different possible sources of uh, fulfilling each order. So delivering on the same day is not, is not always possible. But what we do is uh, we try to, 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 to go to the market with aggressive offering. So uh, our commitment and our SLA to the market is to deliver within two hours for any orders that will be fulfilled from the store, which is something that we are able to achieve to a big extent. While deliveries from the DC cannot be, as we speak, in the same day, uh, this is something that we are dreaming uh, about, and this is something that we can do when we develop also our capability to deliver directly to the guest home. Then we can think about some kind of peritorization or some kind of uh, shipping uh, mechanism that allow us to deliver from the DC even in the same day, and then we can do this consolidation between the two arms. Okay, so how complex shipments are? Which are brand new? Okay, so uh, let me just explain to you. Uh, uh, we don't use multimodal transportation. Our, we only use land transportation. But the complexity in our case is that we use multi-stop uh, uh, multi uh, uh, planning. And uh, uh, if, if you allow me also, I might extend this question to uh, uh, Mr. Hrishi from Enes Bairaj. Uh, he can, I think he can even explain this uh, better than me. Okay, so what's, what's important to us is that, uh, just to uh, yeah, repeat again, so what's also important to us is uh, multi-stop planning, which, uh, which uh, is very important to us because one truck might need to deliver products to more than 20 or 30 stores in one shipment. We have a lot of regulations because, we, and, and also we give a lot of attention to the safety of our drivers. So we have regulations to avoid, for example, drivers uh, driving in one shipment for more than eight hours, I believe. So we are also getting a lot of benefits to avoid having one shipment longer than eight hours because that put a risk on making accidents and so. We are also integrating with here.com and this is also helping us a lot to get uh, much better planning capability since uh, we get also the exact travel time and distance and this gives us more uh, meaningful uh, plan uh, in our case. So uh, I, I will just answer the question. If it didn't answer, I will be available also today and tomorrow. Okay, so uh, regarding the IoT component currently integrated, uh, 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 yes, we do have, since we uh, legally, we, we, um, not only legally, due to many reasons, we have to, uh, but let me, transportation and warehousing. So we are using it primarily in transportation since we do complete traceability of our truck's location uh, throughout the day. Uh, uh, but that's not the only way to track. So we track by uh, IoT, we track uh, truck location, we track temperature, speed, and a lot of other uh, important things. And 
Uh, we also track through the SEAL applications, through the mobile app, since we track each and every event that gets integrated to OTM and also helps us to combine the two uh, pieces of information and get very valuable reporting and KPIs. Okay, any, any more things? Are we done? Okay. Do we have time or? Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, Okay. volume of data is not yet that big since, as I mentioned, we started with one small warehouse. That small warehouse catered for 5% of our operation. It's, uh, the warehouse is uh, 4,000 pallet position. It's not really that big warehouse, and uh, the number of SKUs there is close to 400, 500 SKUs. Uh, as I mentioned, it doesn't cater for more than 5 or 6% of our operation, but again, this is where we wanted to take a, 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 a careful stepwise approach. Uh, because we didn't want to have any impact on our operation. So we started with this warehouse, but what's worth mentioning is that the, the level of performance and the level of integrations, yeah, over, over, we are using it, we are live there since uh, July 2018, so it's more than a year and a couple of months now live. The level of stability and the level of performance and the level of uh, uh, up lifetime of the product is even much better than the local on-prem WMS that we had. It, it's clearly observable. Uh, if I just take the downtime report and the versus SLA of, uh, up, of uh, application availability, Logfire is doing much better compared to even our uh, small, our uh, on-prem WMS, because we run another on-prem WMS application. Uh, there are many customers also, and we had the same doubt uh, when it comes to huge warehouses, since also we have other warehouses that are really huge, but I, and we came across many customers worldwide who have a scale even big, bigger than Nahdi, and they are still uh, able to run with cloud WMS without any issues or any major complaints. Uh, so thanks a lot for your, uh, for your time, thanks a lot for listening and for your attendance. I will be also available if anyone is having more, much, more questions, I will be available today and tomorrow if you just need to catch up and, and connect over coffee or so. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you.